dare great things for Christ. Christ calls us to dare great things. In the marketplace, as well as in the mission field, there has never been a time like the present for the spirit of the Catholic entrepreneur. Now is the time for men and women of great courage and great vision to engage our church and our culture. Now is the time to dare great things. And here is your host as we dare great things, Father Nathan Cromley, the president and founder of the St. John Institute. In my work helping cultural and business leaders grow deeper in their faith, I have had the occasion to be able to preach several times on the life of St. Peter. I'd like to share some of my thoughts with you now, looking at Peter and asking ourselves, what was his leadership style? How did God use and form him to be the rock upon which he built his church? Good morning, everybody. I'm so happy to be with you. The importance of what we're looking at here today, I think it's something that's going to wake up a lot of you into understanding not just who St. Peter is and who he was, of course, for the early church, but also who you are. Uh, When we look at the life of a saint, in particular the life of a saint in the Bible, We are looking at something much greater than an inspirational story. Almost like a lot of people think of the life of a saint, almost like a myth, right? You kind of sink in and then you listen to some sort of fictional exploit of, you know, grandeur as they do these things that you could never imagine doing. And then we all go back to the couch and we open a bag of Fritos and (laughs) just uh, realize that we're not the saint, right? That we're supposed to be. And I don't like that. I don't like that for many reasons, and especially I don't like what it does to us. When reading about the saints only convinces you that you're not one, (laughs) we've missed a little bit of the point. Because if I were to go back and ask the saints themselves whether they think that that they're saints, some would have said yes, you know, of course, and some would have said no, and others would have said I really don't have time to think about this right now. Why? Because the realism of sanctity is as unique as the individuals who receive it. And that means that your holiness is not an optional question. Your holiness means you living the life that God wants you to live, fully redeemed, fully yourselves, if you put holiness on the, on the side and act like it's not something that you have to ascribe to or something that you could actually miss the boat on almost by saying, well, I'm not a saint. I'm never going to be a saint. Realize what you're really saying is that I'm never really going to live the life that I know that I could live. I know that I should live. That means that I'm missing the whole purpose of who I am. And guys, when we do that on purpose, willingly accepting anything less than that fullness for which God has called us and for which he's equipped us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, well, I mean, what a disaster. Now God in his great mercy can forgive us and help us and set us straight, and etc. But not if we completely close ourselves off to it. And beyond what happens to our immortal soul, there's always just the question of what happens to our mortal life. And the people whom God has put in this world dependent on us and on how we're going to answer that question. If you were just sitting in the room right now, if you were just to uh, take a a few minutes and write down, even as I'm talking, you can do this. You can pull out your papers and start writing down the names of people that you know have, you are influencing directly from your wife, your five kids, right? Your nephews, Start writing them down, right? Your cousins, the, my mom, my dad, they're depending on me. And that's not even accountable. Well, of course, there's a soccer team, then there's the book club, and then there's the, and just, if you were to make a list of all your employees, how many people are interacting with you on a daily basis or the decisions that you make on a daily basis? You know, if you're an upper level executive, you put that, I mean, you might have thousands of people who are, 
are depending right now on the decisions that you're making in this room. And when their leader decides that they don't need to have the optimal success that God is calling them towards, their lives are directly impaired. Now think about that. If you are set by God as a leader over your family and you have 24 grandchildren, right? And you decide in your heart that you're not going to shoot for the stars. You have limited the cultural influence that your life will necessarily have over those 24 grandchildren, not to mention over your spouse and everybody else. You've limited it. Why would we want to do that? We don't. God made us leaders and we've accepted that mantle of leadership in our family, in our companies, in our cultures. We've accepted that role that we have because we want to render an account to God with giving him back the fruits of our life and not the excuses of our life. That means that as a leader, I need fundamentally to accept this call to greatness. And to bring that call to greatness to its full fruit. I mean, think about this again. Like, what could your life be in the lives of others if you opened your hearts to hope? And you said, yeah, you know what? I'm out there in my field. I really wish I wasn't in my field. I I wish I wasn't working as hard as I'm working. I wish that I would have made different decisions in my life. But you know what? I'm going to give an example to my kids and to this world around me that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that's by claiming this work that I'm doing as an act of service back to him. Could you just, what, what, how that would l- light up the room around you. And instead of carrying the gloom of feeling like a failure and thinking you didn't do it right and wishing you'd be somewhere else doing something else, you can start to make that impact that your life was supposed to make. But it hinges on the decisions that you make right here in this room. It hinges on whether or not you will accept to be the leader of these people responsible for the impact of your life. And as soon as you do, well, the next question is, well, then how do I do the most good that I possibly can? And my friends, that's the question of the saint. That's the question of the person who's moving forward. That's the question I want you to answer today. Father Nathan is producing an ongoing source of videos to form, unite, and inspire you and your family. Go to eagleeyeministries.org. That's E-A-G-L-E-E-Y-E ministries.org. And subscribe to Eagle Eye Pro. Subscribe today. All right, so I think we need to start with a prayer. We want to talk about the life of St. Peter, and we can't really do that without talking about his master. So let's start with a prayer, shall we? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, O Holy Spirit, Father of the poor, illumine the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us in the same spirit to be truly wise and ever to rejoice in his consolation. Through this same Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Peter, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so we want to look a little bit at at who St. Peter was, okay? Because I'd like to walk with you almost like as if we're on a retreat, through the way that God sculpted the life of St. Peter and the soul of St. Peter. And the reason I want to do this is, of course, you, (laughs) right? So that each one of you realizes that your life is not indifferent to God and that what's happening in your family and in your business is something that God himself wants to take place, that he is in charge of your lives. The moment that we begin this, it's called, if you were in theology, we talk about it as surrender to God's providence, right? But as soon as you realize this, that you are being sculpted by God and everything in your life is something that he wants and wills, well, then you start optimizing it because you allow what happens in your life instead of being measured as the world measures it, that is by worldly success, 
or worldly defeat, you start to measure your life as God measures it, which is called holiness. I didn't make you as if the purpose of your life was to be a successful grandpa. That's not the purpose of your life. The purpose of your life is to be my son. And then I've asked you to be a grandpa. I've asked you to take that, that role on, and you have generously. And it's through your exercise of your grandfatherhood that you will come to a deeper knowledge of me. So when your grandchildren rebel or when they don't listen to you or when they have their difficulties in their lives and you stay faithful to that call and you continue to love and shepherd and correct and rebuke and teach and invest yourselves in their lives, you're actually serving me and I am forming you through those experiences, bringing you to your knees and making you the disciple that I wanted you to be. Now that's exactly the same thing whether you're a grandpa or whether you're the head of a company, whether you're an entrepreneurial founder or whether you're a manager. Wherever God has you, he has you for a purpose and his purpose is to make you a deeper son, a deeper servant, a deeper friend of his heart. And guys, that's why we understand, man, his privileged friends, his privileged tools for doing this in our lives are trial and suffering. <laughs> now, there's also, you know, joy and, you know, these things are in success. Those things also shape us, but they don't shape us nearly as deeply and they don't make us his friend nearly as effectively. Probably because in those other places, we grow. When you're joyful or when you're successful, it's about you. It's about what, you, you know, you're growing in that. And so we can just kind of get in the way a little bit and diminish just by, by the very fact that we're doing it. It's fine, but like it, it, it's just not as pure of a response as somebody who's actually had life take something away from them. When, when life takes a relationship and, and, and tarnishes it or, or takes a, a possibility and, and snuffs it out for you, you it, it hurts and yet in that purity of I just lost something, there's an opportunity, which is an intimacy with our God who says, let me fill it. But what I, well, the only thing we have to do, you guys, when we allow ourselves to recognize that God is leading my life by his providence is not quit in the process. The trial, the hardship, the grind, these are all the journey. And the journey is the gift. In the end of our life, you know, you could look back and say, look at all my trophies. I got them all on the wall. Look at them all. Oh my goodness, a whole trophy room. Nobody cares. <laughs> now, if you won the Stanley Cup, all right, maybe somebody would care. That, 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 then they would care. But if you don't have the Stanley Cup, you just have, I mean, like, what are your, your grandchildren going to look? And they're going to see a bunch of certificates. You know, grandpa was the outstanding salesman of the month. Grandpa was the, you know, and they're going to say, wow, isn't that something? And then they're going to walk out the room. It's not our trophies that define us and our greatness and all those trophies anyway. They're just the fruit and the result of something much deeper called character. And that character is what God is causing for me because character, it never leaves you. Wouldn't it be neat for your grandchildren seeing those trophies? There's nothing wrong with those trophies, those certificates, those plaques. Seeing all those, wouldn't it be neat if they were to become proud of their grandpa by saying, and I am his grandson? That would really be something. Because then what you've passed on isn't all of the trophies. It's somehow or other you communicated that kid during his life who he was and who you were. Where does that come from? That comes from God and your relationship with him. That comes from the experiences of your life that God is putting in front of you and, and the way that you rose to meet them. That comes from the holiness that God is calling you to and it forges that holiness inside of you. My friends, that's exactly what it's like following the life of a saint. St. Peter didn't know he was a saint before he was St. Peter. <laughs> just think about that. St. Peter was walking on the earth. He would have smiled, shook your hand just like anybody else. 
You see all these people that they meet Pope John Paul II, right? And then everybody says, oh my gosh. Well, at the time you were meeting Pope John Paul II, you may have thought that he was a saint, but he was just a human being just like you, shaking your hand. Well, St. Peter was the same way. And what makes so, St. John Paul II so amazing to us is when you see the trajectory of his life and how he embodied the trials of the... You can understand why Time Magazine named him the man of the century. <laughs> it's true. John Paul II's life just was ingrained with all of that we, we went through in the 20th century. And the man of the century, John Paul II. Well, in the same way, our, the life of St. Peter, you have to look at it as God forging and forming him. God working him like, like rock is worked by waves. Sandstone carved by the pounding of the waves to make a certain face, a certain look called the holiness of St. Peter. When I look at the Bible, I, I look at his life. Where, where do we see St. Peter the first, right? We see him being called by Christ. Now that call by Christ is not done in a vacuum. It's deliberate and it's, it's beautiful. Now there's actually three different scenes where we see the call take place. And I'm going to put them a little bit side by side because they show us a lot of who Peter was. Right? So first, is if, you, if you take a look, it's in Matthew Chapter 4, verses 18 to 22. Why don't you open with me? Matthew 4, 18 to 22. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Okay, that's again, that's Matthew 4, 18 to 22. And, and that scene, right, is, is remarkable for many reasons. But the first point I want to point out to you is just the, something that might not, that, that might surprise you. And that's that Simon Peter was a businessman. Now, again, we think to ourselves, what? We thought he's a fisherman. And the number of priests that I've heard talk about fishermen as if they were this somehow this like, uh, you know, I don't even know, like a, 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 a low level entry worker. You know, I can't, everyone, every homily I've ever heard talking about fishermen has always acted to them as if like it's a bunch of guys that go out on a boat and throw a line in the lake, hoping they'll make some food for that night. This was not, this is really underselling the story of what we read here. Because when we read this, we see number one, he's partners. I don't know if you, if you realize this or not, but he's partners with uh, John and James. And his brother Peter is casting a net. They're not dropping a line. They're casting a net. That means that they had to have capital. They had their own boat. They had their own net. And it says later on, nets, plural. Okay. So they had multiple nets. Then they had a boat that was big enough to haul fish in. And again, it's not like you're taking a little boat on a pleasure, pleasure cruise on the lake. You had other things to do. Well, if you're going to haul in, I mean, that's a big boat. Well, where did they get that big boat from? And it actually says, it says it was go th that they were with their father. All right, so we can see that in a little bit greater detail. When we look at it in the Gospel of Mark, if we look at that same scene, Mark 1, 16 to 20, listen to a little bit of the details. Passing along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending the nets. And immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. So this is a scene. They have hired servants. You've got a business. And when you look at, at least it says it there explicitly, right? James and John, the, the sons of Zebedee, you've got a second generation business being handed on from their first generation, who's the founder, of course, and that's their father. So their father is actually there and, and, and working with them, of course. You have Simon, Peter, James, and John. 
You've got a company. This is an entrepreneurial businessman whom Christ has called. Some of you sitting there today are business leaders. You're working in the business world. Do you think, and isn't it neat to think, that God is using your business and your experience to form you to be the leader after his own heart? I mean, just to make this point a little bit, you know, clearer, if you look at Luke chapter 5, right? This one's the second scene. The first one, you got Jesus walking along the side of the Sea of Galilee, and he calls them. But look at Luke 5. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Genesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, Okay, isn't that neat, right? There you've got private enterprise and private property. It's amazing. Simon has a boat. Jesus doesn't say to Simon, you shouldn't have a boat. That's the state's boat. We're going to have the government provide boats for everybody because we don't want people to have boats. No, private property. Simon has a boat. Jesus, and he has permission too. It's kind of neat. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. The respect that Christ has for private property, and therefore the respect that he has for you, the workers who, by the work of your hands, own the tools of your trade. That respect is so, it's amazing. And, and there's Jesus. It'd be almost like Jesus saying, would you mind, you know, making me a hamburger, Mr. McDonald? <laughs> I really, really appreciate having a hamburger, you know. And Mr. McDonald, well, I'll cook up my That's what I do. Exactly. Well, Simon's a fisherman. Now look at this. He asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. Okay, remember, nets, plural. This is not some sort of poor fisherman who's like hoping he catches a fish. He's got capital. He's got a boat. He's got nets in the plural. All right, so he's, he's got, therefore, something to defend. He's got something he's got to maintain. Those nets are going to wear out. He's got to make a certain profit margin in order to reinvest in new nets. I mean, you know, he's got to be thinking about these things. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. Now, look at how it shifted from singular into plural. That means Peter's got workers, right? They, they let down the nets. What do you think it is? Peter and his little friend? No, he's got workers. They signaled to their partners in the other boat. So now you got contract, you've got agreements, you've got splitting up of dividends. You know, I mean, it's not really that, but you see what's going on. They've got partners in the other boat to come and help them. It doesn't say they help, they ask their strangers to come over to lend a hand. It's their partners. And they came and they filled both the boats. So they began to sink. I think that's also kind of neat, right? Because nowhere does it say that Jesus then said, now throw all these fish into the, you know, and, uh, away. We don't care about them. He gave him success and monetary success, right? Christ is speaking the language of the real person. And that means he's speaking your language in your business. And when we act somehow like as if my business had nothing to do with my Christianity, do you realize that Christ is not asking Peter to not be a businessman. He went into the heart of an entrepreneurial business leader in a second generation business to make him the leader of his church because he recognized that that experience of exchange and stress and toil and risk and responsibility for his workers was exactly the type of man that he wanted to form to be the head of his church. And that's why his call is so amazing. Come after me and I will make you fishers of men. It's beautiful. It's a full of respect for what it means to be a fisherman. You know, he didn't say, come after me and and then I'll have you do something totally different. He's like, no, I, I I want there to be continuity. As you were a fisherman for fish, so you will be a fisherman for men. I'm gonna take the skills that you learned there in your business And I'm going to ask you now to apply them for spiritual ends. I want you to take the character that was forged in those late nights and those stressful situations in the risk environment that you had and the responsibility that you felt towards your workers. And I'm going to ask you now to deploy that to care for their souls. 
I think it's amazing. It does, it's not just business that does that. There's a lot of other places where God forges us. But what's beautiful, I think, here in the call of Peter is to recognize who Peter was. Peter was no ninny, right? Peter was not some sort of like willy-nilly guy who's just walking around with religious sentiment, sentiments in his heart. Peter was a businessman who had people and lives depending on him and he stepped up to the plate day after day and was making it happen. And he seemed to be successful. He had partners, he had workers, he had nets. He was making it happen. And that, and that, that mind, that person is the one whom our Lord loved and called to be the head of his church. Guys, this is beautiful to see that because he loves you too. As you look at your life and you look at the, at the background and the past and the history of where you came from, I want you to see God's call and God's working. And then I want you understanding that to see how much he's appreciated what you've done. Swinging your hammer, laying on your back, fixing cars, starting your restaurant businesses, all the things that you've done, those late nights and those, God appreciates that. And he's using that to form the leader of your families and of your hearts. And you have to think as much about you as God does. What if you had the same esteem for your life and your background as God did? Well, I tell you what you do. You would take that background, that esteem, and you'd start to apply it towards the great things he's calling you to do, called leading your family and re reaching the hearts of your grandchildren and being the leaders in our culture that we need. This is what St. Peter shows us, and it's a trajectory for our own lives. Dare great things for Christ. Share your feedback with Father Nathan. Send us an email at info at stjohninstitute.org. That's info at stjohninstitute.org. And don't forget to subscribe to premium video content to form, unite, and inspire you at Eagle Eye Pro on our website, eagleeyeministries.org. That's eagleeyeministries.org.